All right, so you're hearing in the background some sounds. This is a, this is a classic restaurant. This is actually a YouTube video. Eight hours of restaurant sound. It's kind of interesting to try to work to if you get bored one day. Um, but it kind of funnels out. It's like white noise, but a little more active. So I can feel like I'm in a coffee shop, but not really. So imagine walking into a restaurant. Uh, you're greeted at the door. Uh, and actually, this restaurant is the homemade cafe here in Berkeley. And you're greeted at the door by this really nice woman. She's, uh, she's the hostess. Uh, she leads you to the back of the restaurant, to a counter. She gives you a menu. She says, your waiter's going to be right with you. So you start to peruse, you start to look around. You see the sights and sounds. You, see the, you smell the bacon. You smell the eggs. This is a, a, a classic brunch cafe. Uh, once you've settled in, you've got your menus, you look over the drinks that are offered, your waiter comes over and he asks, uh, and this is, this is our hostess, this is our waiter, he asks, what, what can I get for you to drink? And since it's only 11.15, you order an orange juice. Rob Loach, your coworker and friend, uh, <laughs> since it's already 11.15, he orders a mimosa. <laughs> um, so the waiter comes back with the drinks and asks if there are any questions on the menu. Uh, there is one burning question in your mind. What is a breakfast burger? And the waiter goes into this spiel. It's actually ground bacon, ground sausage, and ground beef on a French toast, a cinnamon French toast patty with eggs your way thrown on top. Is and this a real restaurant? This is a real restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> is that a real You're going to have to go. This, this is a real <laughs> item in this restaurant. <laughs> So you, you get your question answered. It is exactly what you wanted when you were a child. Right? <laughs> um, so he, he describes this beautiful sandwich. You know that that's what you're going to get. Um, so you, you give him your order. You watch him wander around the counter. Uh, and he places his, his ticket on the little ticket holder thingy, which I've called the ticket rotating thingy. Uh, the chef then comes over. He looks at it. He's got some other orders going on, so uh, he might not get to it at that moment. Uh, halfway through your orange juice, there's a pause in conversation. You look up to see the head chef taking a step back from the grill. Starts to look over the ticket rotating thingy again. He pulls a few tickets down, arranging them slightly. Then starts to call them out uh, and requesting his team, um, Hey, team, there are two, uh, two pieces of French toast that I need to get you to fire. There are um, two eggs coming up. They're going to be scrambled. We've got a bacon burger coming out. We also need, uh, we also need some coffee, uh, hot coffee. So you, uh, you're watching this whole team work flawlessly. They're rotating in and out, squeezing by each other. They're working really, really well together, and communication is key. Uh, the support chef then calls back. The, the French toast is getting fired, but I'm low on powdered sugar. The, the chef looks over to his busboy slash prep cook, says, hey, I need some powdered sugar over on the bread station. The guy scrambles in with powdered sugar, fills up these large shaking devices with the powdered sugar. With that cleared up, everybody gets back into the swing of things. When the whole order starts to come together, the head chef puts, uh, puts the bacon burger on this plate that already has the French toast on. He drops in the eggs. It, the home fries, which smell delicious with the onions and the oregano, get piled onto the plate. He then puts guacamole, sour cream, and uh, a little bit of salsa on it because you're a glutton. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so once that order is taken care of, he puts it up on the, the expedition plate, uh, the hot plate. The waiter comes over, grabs the ticket, looks over it, sees that the order is, is just right. He then brings it around to you as he's bringing it around the counter. He drops off the ticket with the hostess and then presents you with your beautiful meal. This, my friends, is the <laughs> breakfast burger. French toast, bacon, sausage, and beef burger with scrambled eggs and powdered sugar and, and the home fries. And is it king of shining glory? It's beautiful. So then after you, you're starting to eat, you look up a little bit, you see they're taking a, a quick break. The kitchen is nasty. They've been slinging eggs and bacon burgers all over. So the head chef looks over to his, his sous chef and he says, um, let's clean up a little bit. They start organizing. Then he goes, that bacon burger could have been done just a little bit quicker. Um, next time, let's, let's try to get that fired a little quicker. Is that okay? The sous chef nods in agreement. Uh, the whole the stations get reset. 
the prep cooks coming in and taking care of some things. Um, you've witnessed a well-oiled team. You look over and the hostess is now looking at your ticket. She's starting to kind of add prices to the ticket. She's starting to tabulate what happens and the, the value of the service they offer. And she, uh, she gives that bill to the, the waiter. The waiter brings it over to you and drops it off. <clears throat> so, you've had this incredible meal. You've got your ticket, you walk up to the front of the restaurant, you pay for your meal, you walk away getting ready for your now 12 o'clock nap. Uh, you're, you're absolutely fed. Let me kill this, this uh, restaurant audio. So before we jump into how that's agile, just a quick word about me, Justin Rhodes, uh, project manager at Kalamuna. It's a web development agency here in Oakland, uh, or I guess a little south in Oakland. I'm into motorcycles, vaporizers, having long hair, carpentry, and I really love eating, especially when there's bacon involved. But I guess the real question now you've got, since I've set you up to this, this story, is how is this agile? Well, maybe we'll, we'll go over that. So let's start first from the beginning. Who are we trying to appease? The client. Agile is client focused. This is really the goal of why we do what we do as project managers or if you're a small shop trying to offer value to someone, the client comes first. Agile is a way that we're really, really ramping up that level of communication directly to the client, making sure there's buy-in at all stages, as well as giving that transparent look in from the outside. So firstly, Agile, I think Agile applies really well to a restaurant. So um, when I, <laughs> When I was talking about this experience in the Homemade Cafe, uh, I'm sure some of you saw where I was going, but uh, let's, let's just break this down uh, from the beginning. Clients walk in through the doors, um, there's this uh, entrance where you're, you're updated to the process. The hostess tells you where you're supposed to sit, the hostess gives you a menu, the hostess tells you that the, project, uh, the product owner, or I should say the waiter, is going to come over and give you uh, your menu and take your order. So instead of having hostess, waiter, and bill, I've changed it simply to account manager. And that's your, your hostess. Then I've changed the, the waiter over to a product owner. And then this whole meal, we'll call it a sprint. And these items that we're ordering, let's call it an epic. And now this is an issue ticket, or this is a project, if you will. So if we're thinking about this in the frame of, of mind of agile, when most people see a restaurant buzzing away super efficiently, I take a step back and look at how it applies to a project, how my projects might be able to run a little bit more efficiently, or how it applies to an agile philosophy. And let's, uh, let's, take, let's strip out, just like I've done here, let's strip out those, those phrases of the description of the, the restaurant and add in the agile, uh, agile titles, and maybe that'll help you understand a little bit more about agile and how projects can run, really run smoothly. So the clients walk in through the doors to a small cafe and they're oriented with the process. The account manager welcomes them to the company, offers them a demo of the projects they have delivered in the past, or a menu. Uh, they've shown uh, the prices to those tasks that they've done in the past, and they've shown, in some cases, pictures of what that might actually look like in real life. The uh, product, in product owner then enters and introduces himself, answers the questions, and gives the first deliverable to start the process of discovery and requirements gathering, and in both processes, there's a drink involved. Um, <laughs> once the requirements are gathered, and the product owner documents those, documents those on a ticket system, uh, the epics are well documented and then shared with the scrum master to begin using in their issue tracking system. <laughs> a little round thing. I really like those things. I want for my house. But we've got the chef, the sous chef, and the prep cook now relabeled as the scrum master, the designer, and the team. So once the requirements are gathered, the product owner has documented those diligently. They have their own shorthand in the restaurant business if you've ever been a part of a, uh, a service industry. They document them really well. So in our ticket specifically, it showed what we wanted taken out, what we wanted added in, what was mo most important to us. And that was, that was in shorthand, documented directly to the scrum master. Uh, as the Scrum Master receives the new requirements, if no more documentation is necessary, sometimes they'll push back and say, hey Jim, this is too messy, rewrite it, or hey, we didn't get the exact things that we need from the documentation, please give us more information. Once all that's set, then the, uh, the Scrum Master starts calling out the exact requirements and expressing the timing 
of the deliverables, when they should be started, when they should be finished, how they can all come together, just like that burger, just like the eggs and the French toast. The designer then looks over the, the scrum board or the issue tracking system uh, and says, well, I, I have a blocker. I need more, more uh, powdered sugar. Then the team scrambles to clear those blockers. The whole entire team looks at their stations and says, well, I can, I can clear that. I've got a little bit of time. Or that's my specific role. I can jump in and help clear that. The, um, so after the team has worked to unblock that, everybody flies into implementation. Um, the, the, you know, the spatulas and the eggs are flying everywhere. Everybody's in it. But then halfway through, the scrum master, or the head chef, looks up and he goes, is everybody OK? Do we need anything? Is, is, uh, when, what's the ETA on that French toast? Two minutes. Two minutes, says the sous chef, or in this case, the designer. So everything's starting to come together. Everybody's done a check-in with the team. The prep cook's there waiting, listening, uh, and the, the waiter on the side is listening also to be able to come back to the client and say, hey, we have two more minutes on the French toast. We'll play it, and then we'll come back to you with the food. It's a, a, a quick standout. <clears throat> I think I have a slide for that. This is a stand-up. Uh, if you're not familiar with stand-ups, where everybody on the team gets together and talks about when the food's going to get I mean, the product is going to get ready. <laughs> Does that really apply there? Because the stand-up <laughs> is always the same time in, uh, uh, of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't really apply. I, I'm not buying that bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So once the product is ready, the deliverables are finished, that gets plated and shown to the, the internal team. They take a look at it. They take a step back and see the mastery of their creation. Uh, a burger, cheese, French toast, ridden monstrosity. And then they compare that to what the original requirements are. They take the ticket and they look at it and they say, well, we've, we've built exactly what the, the client needed. We've done, uh, we've fulfilled all those requirements and in a way that they wanted, let's get it to the product owner. The product owner is looking over all these things, making sure that it actually is what it's supposed to be, takes the ticket off the, the ticket thingy and out of the issue tracking system, he then delivers the product to the client for a demo. This is where the first bit of feedback comes. If, it, if the burger is medium rare, they should be ready to take it back and make it rare, or make it well done, if that was the, the client's request. This is the first level of conversation. But the product owner is confident that they've done a great job, that they've, they've fulfilled all the requirements. It's just the last bit of feedback that needs to go. Well, in this case, the burger was perfect. It was ready to go. So the, the, um, uh, the product owner then drops off the, the tickets to the account manager who tabulates all the estimates and all the delivered time, then offers the bill back to the client. This transaction is about to be done. Client pays, client, well, client eats, client pays, and then exits the building. This is, uh, in my mind, Matthew's not, not in Matthew's mind, but in my mind, a really good example of how agile works in a business setting, how a lot of efficient teams that you admire or that you don't see anything negative happening, they work with an agile system. Feedback constantly flowing. And the whole entire time, mind you, we as clients were able to look in, sitting at the booth, staring at the kitchen of this diner style restaurant. We were able to actually see all this happening in real time. I know for a fact that there was no spit in my burger. I know for a fact that this was built with quality, uh, quality ingredients because I saw them all happening. I saw the communication. I saw the overall estimate and time being met. This was, to me, a really good example of an agile system. <clears throat> and then, obviously, there's a retrospective. <laughs> Somebody's got to clean up afterwards. <laughs> so this is also another important thing. You've got to clean up, you've got to reset, but then figure out a way that you did things well uh, and what you can do better next time. So this is all happening while we're shoving our faces full. So what about real life? <clears throat> Let's talk about real life, how I've applied agile in my actual daily life. Uh, in 2015, in October, I became a homeowner for the first time. And as, if any of you have bought a house before, you know the first thing that you have to do is renovation. You've got to make this house a home. You've got to make it look like you imagined it could look like, and you've also got to make it work like you need it to work like. So I, being a, a little bit obsessed with project management and everything, uh, I created a Trello board. Um, <laughs> And firstly, you know, you have to identify, as, any, as in any project, whether it's Waterfall or Agile, you have to identify what's the project's budget, what's the timeline. And for me, my, my project budget was about $10,000 that I had negotiated into my, my mortgage payments, or my mortgage. 
uh, my initial loan. And then the timeline was a little bit shady because I was traveling a lot for work, doing speaking, doing uh, conferences uh, during the end of that year. So I was hoping that by, by early 2016, I was gonna be able to move in. <clears throat> so you'll actually see uh, over here on the left, so I've got my ice box, which is all the things that I really wish I could that don't tell anybody, but I have a Pinterest account. That's where I found like all the cool stuff that I wanted to do and I put it on my, in my ice box. Then I've got a list that I'm actually using for a contractor that I had to have uh, do some plumbing, do some electrical work, and then all the stuff that I needed to do. Here's the stuff that's currently in progress, and this is real life. This is actually what I'm still doing, and then here's all the things that are done. And note this terrible Looney Tunes <laughs> border that I had to completely destroy. I was like two hours into scraping off this border with like this little cowboy spur looking thing and this spray. I, I see some commiserate looks back there. Uh, I was like two hours through and I was only halfway through this like 12 by 16 room. And I thought to myself, if I burn this house down, I could, I could collect insurance money, right? <laughs> Just burn it all down. Anyways, I'm not meant for this kind of manual labor. Anyways, uh, that, that room is painted and, and lovely now, hence why it's in the dumb category. Um, I thought that you'd added the border. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> when he has kids, he'll add it back. No, that's my personal preference. <laughs> I dig it. So I've got this 10,000 budget. By the time that demolition on a couple of the walls, some plumbing and some electricity was done, I had about $5,000 left. Uh, and one of my favorite agile processes that I employ pretty regularly is uh, limiting the work in progress, limiting the WIP. Um, this is a, a process, not only do I do this with like projects and money and things that I'm spending time on, but I also do this with possessions. It's kind of kind of strange. Every possession that you have takes some upkeep, takes some time, so I kind of like take over a room and lay out all of my stuff. This is really OCD, I'm sorry, I'm just giving you part of myself. And I lay out all my stuff, categorize it, and then think how much effort does it take to keep these things? How much money, time, materials does it take to keep these things? And then I limit those things because that's literally the work in progress. If it's, if it's not being taken care of, it's not gonna be useful to me. So I, this is a limiting work in progress. So I laid out everything that I wanted to do. I chose the projects that I was, I was working on and then realized my own bandwidth, not only for money, but for time to be able to put in these projects. So I limited my work in progress and then I, I prioritized. And so that's why I've got a couple of things actually done. Instead of all of these things happening gradually, some of them had the emphasis and I was able to move forward because those were the highest priorities. Some of the, those priorities were installing a shower in the master half bath. It was only a half bath, so I had to literally move a toilet and put in a, a beautiful shower that I was really proud of. Um, I had to run new plumbing to new areas of the house to be able to create a new laundry room. Um, I built a frame for a mattress because I literally was sleeping on a mattress on the floor like a college kid. Um, I am really like a college kid in a lot of ways. But I built this, this beautiful mattress, a uh, frame for my mattress. And at the end of all this, I had still a lot of other projects. And by having it all mapped out, I was able to, to kind of concern myself with, well, where is their redundancy? If I go into painting one room, Maybe I can paint five or six rooms at the same time, or you know, a bathroom and a couple of, of bedrooms, stuff like that. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Uh, it takes more more time than estimated. What is that? Uh, Peterson's law? No. Uh, Hofstadter's law. Anything so. takes 20% more time than you initially estimated, even when considering Hofstadter's law. <laughs> um, so yeah, it never takes because it's Would you rather questions afterwards or? Right now it's perfect. So how, how do you determine work in progress? I know you said available sure. bandwidth, but how do you determine available bandwidth? Yeah, so first, uh, my process, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people have different processes, there really is uh, a, a couple of good uh, resources for this work in progress. The Lean, what is it, Lean Business book, I think is what it's called. There's several, uh, several in the series of Lean books. So there's like the Lean Startup, Lean Business Models, things like that. Uh, in a lean book, this is where I originally read about the works in progress, uh, so definitely check that out. But for my personal process when it comes to work in progress, I literally do a brain dump. It's a, a Google Doc or a, a, you know, I don't know if people use Microsoft Word, but it's a Google Doc that I just pound out all the ideas, all the thoughts of things that I'm currently doing. Then I, I organize that a little bit afterwards and I say, okay, well these are all the things that I'd like to get done, things that I, I need to get done, and then it goes into a Trello. Uh, and then I add as much documentation to each of those things as possible. 
I even sometimes add estimates to those. It's going to take me you know, 12 hours to put all the tiles up in my shower. So that's how I build this list. Does that answer your question? Well, it's more a question of you have a team of people. How do you know how much work you can get done given the team of people you have? That's a great question. Um, so if, you're, if your company is currently employing time tracking services, that's the first way. Um, so it depends on whether your company is doing an, an agile process, a waterfall process, <coughs> are you doing estimation in hours or story points? There's a lot of variables. The main thing is being able to take a step back as a manager, compare the work that has been coming out of your team to the work that needs to be done, seeing if there are parallels in the estimates, and then being able to predict then and estimate then what your team's velocity actually can be, given there are no, no major blockers, and then obviously padding that by 20%. <laughs> when you're planning your own time and estimating your own time, what do you pad it by? <laughs> I, I about like 35%. I'm going to take a break to watch New Girl. So, in this situation, does, does that answer your question though? Like, the idea that showing work that's been done in the past, showing how quickly your team has done that work, and using that as a, a footprint to gauge what the, yeah, the future is going to be? I understand the concept. Okay. I'd love to talk to you more about that afterwards. Great. Yes? Well, well, what if the work is not repetitive? It's unique each and every time. It's kind of hard to estimate something that you've never done before. You've never remodeled a house before. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great question. In this case, firstly, relying on your whole entire team to do estimates is huge. Uh, a, a really good agile process is called uh, poker estimation. So you take small features, you break those down into all the subtasks that there might be involved. Uh, in completing that feature. Then the team, as a group, you take everybody's time and you annoy the crap out of them by setting up like a two hour meeting. You go over all of those requirements. And you say, how long do you think this would take you? And a designer versus a developer is going to tell you different things. A senior developer versus a junior developer is gonna tell you different things. And you let them kind of fight about it. You let them talk to each other and say, well, this is only going to take two hours. And the senior developer steps in and he says, no, this is going to take 16 hours because you're forgetting the level of difficulty it's going to be to integrate this API. And you allow them to juke it out a little bit. At the end of that, you'll find somebody's moved on their estimate. And that's where you, you, you nail it down. You say, OK, I think this is the right estimate. So relying on your team of experts to, to really estimate out, that might be another key way to, to minimize that lack of knowledge in the, the new spaces you're venturing into. And then add 20%. Then add 20%. <laughs> you guys, is that going to be your takeaway? <laughs> yeah. OK, great. Um, so where was I? Yeah, so with this, this process, I was able to lay out everything that I wanted to do. I identified places where there was redundancy, and then I might be able to, to kind of snowball some of my efforts. Uh, but then I also acknowledged that I'm noncommittal. As a 28-year-old single guy, I have problems with commitment, especially when it comes to wall paint. And so I started the project where I literally compiled all the different colors that I thought might look good in rooms on walls and then chose a wall and just painted all those colors on the wall good just to see what God. it would look like. Yeah, so this is just a... Yellow is always yellower than you think it's going to be. It is. And this was like a gray tan and it turned out... This, the tone of this projector is a little off, but um, if you want, you can find this on my YouTube channel. But it's uh, just a fun little project. That's a huge. Did you keep that design? Yeah, this is actually what all of uh, all of my team and clients see every day when they chat with me on on Hangouts. Huh. This is behind. So you never picked a color. I did pick a color. So <laughs> this enabled me to, to tell that like the darker blue was going to be way too. Uh, it make the bathrooms feel way too small. The tans were kind of boring, so I put those in the living room uh, and then put that in the guest room. There was a lighter blue that I used, this actual light blue here. I turned that into uh, my main color for bathrooms. So I, I have this nice little almost Tar Heel blue for the bathrooms because I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and then the, the dark navies were just way too, way too, uh, felt make everything feel way too small. So I was able to choose. That's awesome. Nice. So, um, <laughs> The, the, the main point of that is taking all the work that your team has to do, understanding where there might re be redundancies, that's a true agile practice. I use that in my own personal life because it saves me a lot of time, saves me uh, money and materials. Um, this is something that I promised to talk about to a couple of people. I actually had some slides, some pictures of some Tinder conversations that I've had, but found out that's illegal to do. So uh, <laughs> what, I, what I'll do is I'll recap some of those conversations. Um, one in particular I had, uh, it was a nice little conversation. She was, she was 24. We were having a nice chat about books that we had read and had in common. 
Then we went out on this first date. I took her to a, a nice little bar, and Asheville has the highest per capita uh, of breweries than anywhere else in the country. Uh, so it's called Beer City USA, so we have lots to choose from. But um, we're on this nice date. I felt a little apprehension. She warmed up. We were fine. After the date, I dropped her off at her house, and I start my usual terrible necessity for a retrospective. So the texts go along the lines <laughs> of, hey, I had a great time. I hope you did too. I'm just digging. Like, Go ahead, give me the feedback. She says, yeah, I had a good time too, thanks so much. I said, yeah, I, I you know, shaved since the last time. Uh, I hope that wasn't awkward to walk into a date with a guy with a huge beard. And she goes, yeah, I was expecting the huge beard. I really like beards. Note to self, set expectations better next time in your Tinder profile pictures. If you have a beard in your Tinder, probably should have a beard in real life. So these kinds of conversations really help. I think if you apply these kinds of conversations to your, your married life or with your significant other, they also help. Retrospectives on fights is actually a thing that some of my coworkers do. When they have knockdown, drag out fights, they cool off, they take a second, they realize how they communicated well, and they also realize how they could have communicated better. One of my friends actually came to a conclusion that him and his girlfriend, they need to sit down on the bed and hold hands when they're, when they're arguing with each other because one of them is very, very large and kind of scary in his stature, and he might have a tendency to, to bully in those situations, and she will kind of shrink away. So if they're sitting on the, both the same playing field, they can, uh, they can talk in a civil manner. This is, this is how people can deal with their, their personal issues too. Retrospectively looking at what you've done and how you can do it better uh, and how you did it well. So uh, other stories, um, let's see. Other stories that I, I might wanna share, might not wanna share, this one's actually fun. Uh, my roommate and I were trying to build a bar. We're, we're kind of building the bachelor pad thing. Uh, he's, he's a world-class bartender. He actually has gotten a couple of awards, and he's really good at a game we call MacGyver drinking, where he wanders around the house and finds random items to put into drinks, and it usually turns out incredible, sometimes <laughs> terrible. But uh, one drink ended up being a Reese's peanut butter bourbon shake, where there was, I turned around at one point, and he was shoving organic peanut butter into a shaker cup, then cracking eggs into it, and I'm like, what the hell are you doing? And it turned out to be, uh, basil Hayden bourbon with honey, almonds, peanut butter, and that sounds good. Uh, there was <laughs> uh, egg white, heavy cream with a little bit of soda water, so it fizzed just perfectly with chocolate shaved on the top. It was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Huh. But what we we do in this bar, trying to build this bar, we're we're both kind of you know looking to save a little bit of money. So we've planned out all the things that we need. We set up our priorities. We created a list, a backlog of items that we wanted to accomplish, features if you will. And then with those lists of drinks, it was actually drinks that we identified as being our priorities, we then broke those down into the ingredients or subtasks. What do we need to purchase in order to make this bar actually functional? So as we kind of went through this process, we realized bourbon was in most of our drinks, that there was some soda water in most of our drinks, that there was lemon, simple syrup. So all these items were pretty simple to purchase, and then we were able to build this kind of backlog of drinks that we could, we could purchase just a couple of bottles and make a plethora of drinks. Uh, so we approached it in kind of an agile manner in that we did a planning session, we had conversations, we did stand-ups about where we were with our money that we were gonna put towards the bar and where we were with buying those actual items. We then came to our friends with these actual drinks that we had purchased and then made and asked for feedback because they, had, in the end, were gonna be the clients, the, the um, users. And then we kind of cycled through this feedback process and built a really nice little bar that has to date a total of $300 worth of, of bottles, but we can make over 200 drinks. Um, it's, it's really nice, you just have to buy fresh lemons every single time. <laughs> so with that, I, I hope you guys have seen a little bit more into my mind and seen a little bit more into how you can apply Agile, not only to what's happening in the world around you, but also to yourself and how you can build on that knowledge that you have in your current career to kind of expedite things going on in your own lives. But I'd love to answer questions and, and take feedback. What have you stopped doing in your personal life that you used to do? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I stopped vaporizing in rooms uh, that I had friends in. Um, <laughs> retrospectively, that was, that was some good feedback and criticism. Uh, no, there's, there's a lot of personal things, honestly. Uh, in retrospectives, in conversations, and in feedback cycles with uh, significant others, I've found little ticks, little strange things, especially leave the dishwashing packing alone, dishwasher packing alone, 
I feel the necessity to dive in, like make sure all the plates are in the right spot and make sure all the bowls are in the right spot. And I know now that that's, that's caused the breakup in two occasions. So <laughs> I try to stay away from the kitchen when the dishwasher is being packed. Uh, and that is actual feedback and that is actually the truth. Like I've had those conversations post breakup. Like what happened? Dishwasher. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, on, on the house right now, what about yeah. uh, identifying blockers? Absolutely. Blockers, in most of the case, is going to be time or money. But there's also some things like I couldn't build a whole entire separate laundry room without plumbing. Plumbing is a blocker. Make sure that that's cleared the way. And then understand the timeline of when that plumbing can happen and when the electricals can happen to be able to implement the final project. So why buy a dryer in month one? when your plumbing and electricity isn't going to be done until month three. Wait, save that purchase for later. Um, it, it truly does work out better. One of the, uh, one of the uh, prime tenets of, uh, of Agile is uh, iteration. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you, I don't know, you're doing your laundry room. Mm -hmm. How do you iterate on that? There's always going to need to be additions. Mm -hmm. Learning from the things that you've done before, using those to the things that are happening in the future. Um, and knowing that my laundry machine, it's kind of the laundry room is built in a, a specific area, a specific way. I had to build in a fake wall because there's uh, cement behind where, uh, where the plumbing is. So I had to build a fake wall to cover up that, that plumbing and electricity. Um, knowing that I'm going to be building houses in the future, this is, this is actually in my uh, terrible, this is really awful, awful to admit too. I have a life Gantt chart, right? <laughs> um, so, knowing that, knowing that in 10 years I will have a total of five houses and that laundry rooms will have to be made, the retrospective things that I'm learning now, I will not orient that laundry, that fake wall to a point facing this way. I will orient that so the fake wall accepts the laundry machine into it. Uh, these, are, these are iterative. In some cases, there are projects that you ship immediately that do not have that feedback cycle to a second sprint or second stage, but uh, that, is, that is part of the iteration. Ar archive those Gantt charts and look at them in 10 years. I hope to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of imagine my project manager life as a big art show. Uh, I, you know, I, I told one of my developers the other day that as I'm looking over his timesheets, I can tell what's happening in his life. I can know when he's having a fight with his girlfriend or when he was kicked out of the house or sleeping on the couch. I can know when he's like, and that means he's coding at 2 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. because he's just pissed off and then his code comes out and it gets pushed back for like two or three revisions before a poll happens. Like I can tell what these guys are doing. And so like showing that in a, in a big data kind of way I think would be really cool. So that. Life Gantt chart, isn't that awfully waterfall of you? It's very waterfall, except um, in yearly cycles I've built in retrospectives to be able to adjust the Life Gantt chart. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, Matthew Saunders. I see you. And that's on your birthday. Yeah, it's on my birthday. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually, uh, it's actually the weekend after my birthday. Usually, I take off into the woods for three or four days. And I uh, about in, after 2008, I suddenly was living alone. I could do whatever I wanted to my house, and I, I was like, "Whoopee! Okay, I can start all the projects." And um, I started all the projects. And I very quickly realized I'm a great project starter and a terrible project finisher. Mm -hmm. So I gave myself, OK, I can only have three open projects at a time. And that worked great until I started kind of changing the definition of done mm -hmm. <laughs> so that I could say, oh, this one's done, so I can start another one. Um, and then I literally made a Kanban board. Mm -hmm. So I now just like, OK, it's basically done as long as I make another ticket for the piece I left undone. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you are in shared company. I, I currently have uh, six Kanban boards, or Trello boards, if you will, uh, that I use for, for branding, for renovations, for relationships. Can't show you those <laughs> for, for things like that. Have it's, you ever showed like one of these Kanban boards around relationships to the relationship? Don't. Um, don't do it. I, I dated an <laughs> agile coach for a little while, and yeah, still don't. don't yeah, do don't it. do it. <laughs> it's terrible. Idea. It's awful. Uh, it's also a really terrible idea to try to try to vet all of your options in the same rooms and, and <laughs> play with like value propositions with four girls at the same time. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> terrible idea. Terrible idea. What other questions do we have, Kevin? Oh, Justin, I love you. Yeah, what's up? Um, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but uh, maybe some advice. Sure. One of the things I struggle with is trying to get clients to who have traditionally 
done the waterfall, mm. depend on it, rely on it, that's just their thing. Yeah. To get them to adopt our agile methodologies yeah. and our, so they insist on a linear project plan. Mm. So as a specific example, things like mock-ups. Yeah. Uh, they want mock-ups on a certain date mm. and they want to check and say we approve or not approve it, whereas we're, I, I struggle and I'm looking for, and this is yeah. to anyone, advice of, it's, a space. it's an iterative process, like tell us some things, we'll throw a couple of your way, oh well I don't like it on the right, I'd rather you drag it down to the left to put this up. That mm -hmm. iteration, they don't seem to get it, I struggle trying to make them see they want a deadline because they have to get it approved by some vice president. They want, sure. and sometimes you know I can give general deadlines, but yeah. that iterative process I can't get them to grasp that. Yeah, have advice. Have on. you documented your 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 uh, your process? Do you have it written down in a in a friendly way with big big graphics? And was delivered with the contract of this is our standards, but so you put it into the contract. Yeah, that's what you do. Like you write into the contract. Um, see, the, see attachment A, this is our process, this is what you're bound by if you're going to work with us. Um, and uh, it's just usually, hard to enforce, you know, you yeah. don't want to lose the customer to a certain extent, but at the same yeah. time, when they say, well, that's not what I understood, well, mm -hmm. it's in the contract, and we had meetings, and we agreed upon mm -hmm. it, but you still didn't understand it, so you kind of want to give them the benefit and work with them, so I've, I end up with these sure. bastardized hybrid things. Yep. I don't want to encourage you to, to be subversive, but what you should do is be subversive <laughs> and really work to make sure they understand why it's a benefit, right? So in, in this situation, we've, we've similarly had a client that uh, had a feedback cycle not only internally in that department that we were working to build a site for, but also with their, their creative team, their marketing team, so there were several tiers of approval they had to have and they were pretty good about suggesting what times those might hit you know we might go over on this this deadline because we're in this approval process and uh, you know Sharon from marketing takes like 16 weeks to actually get approval so we we have had those clients before and that does expedite the process of, of iteration it kind of makes you only take a couple of swings at it before really nailing it down before it gets shipped off through the the whole waterfall process on your clients end. Um, so my suggestion to you is pull in those stakeholders that might be blockers on their side. Yep. Have meetings with them and show them the work, but educate them in that, hey guys, these are these are just wireframes. We did mood boards for you, you liked the colors, you liked the fonts, you liked what was happening. Now we're doing wireframes. These aren't set, these aren't the pixel perfect images of what's gonna happen on the site, but we wanna make sure that you're familiar with the, <coughs> the you know, the phrasing, or not even phrasing, with the, the way things are organized on the page, where those things go. Make it a slow process and make sure they understand it is a slow process, that it moves parallel uh, or even tangential to your development process. It's not representative of how the overall project is working. And that's why you know, having a demo of the functionality of a site and then having the pretty things happen afterwards and showing off those wireframes might help. But really pulling in, roping in those stakeholders in those big meetings to get their feedback in real time, that's been hugely useful. Not only do they feel like they've got buy-in immediately, but they also give feedback immediately, so you don't have to wait two, three, 17 weeks before you get that feedback loop closed. I can't always get the highest end stakeholders because they have intermediaries. Yeah. They're supposed to be. That, when they're not willing to take the risk to say I approve or disapprove, I have to run that up. I completely I up understand that. Yeah, is it so bad practice? I'm guessing that this is, is governmental or educational or, or some. So <laughs> when you're in those situations, the people that you're dealing with as, as the quote unquote product owner, they truly are afraid for their jobs, right? Another company has now been brought in to do what they're supposed to be doing with their job, and they're, they're really clinging to control over that. And my, I, I've taken product owners aside in Fair private enough. conversations and said, listen, I really want to make you the hero. I want to make you look like a badass to all your coworkers. They're going to see that you're in control of this project because I'm going to keep you up to date with every single step. And on top of that, we're going to deliver something that's going to knock everybody's socks off because they've been able to see this process unfold. But when that final reveal comes, they're not going to be surprised. They're just going to know it works. That, that kind of conversation really empowers you to say, hey, let's pull in those other stakeholders. Let's get them in here because we need to show off how much cool stuff we've been doing with your help. Make them the flag bearer internally for your company, and you'll you'll kind of avoid some of those problems. Start off projects really early with that kind of empowerment, and I think you might might avoid some of these problems. Yeah, 
we've we've tried some clients are yeah. more receptive than others. Absolutely. Is it bad practice? And my mm -hmm. same follow up question: Is it bad practice to have I lost an agile methodology if I have iterative process, but with a deadline of let's say wireframe will give you three of them, but here's the cutoff when you have to make a decision. Have I bastardized firstly, the financial process by then or no? Firstly, no. Secondly, did it work? I'll let you know. <laughs> so if it works, then it's not a bastardization. Agile is not just a noun, right? Agile is an adjective. Nobody can really say they practice full agile if they're constantly holding themselves to these rigorous standards of agile, right? The idea that you can iterate, that you can move with agility being the main word, through these crazy chaotic systems of other, other companies and clients. That's really why we do what we do. These are guidelines. This is the pirate's rules. We don't have rigorous standards. We have suggestions, right? And so these things can help get projects running, but if a deadline works for you on this particular project, use a deadline. Uh, I, I can't... Well, just like milestones is what I've been calling them. Milestones is absolutely avoid huge. Using the word deadline. No, that's, that's absolutely important. Because like, my back-end developer mm -hmm. can't start on some things until we've got sign-off on this. Like, so I have to sometimes say, yeah. No, that's, that's right in line with agile thinking. And, and a ton, and a ton of that. different, a ton of uh, agencies uh, um, use ag agile methodologies, but but uh, but also have quite a few waterfall kinds of uh, uh, bits like you're talking about, and you know people kind of call it scrummerfall or agile, or, uh, agile, agile or scrummerfall. <laughs> Um, That's kind of what it sounds like what we're doing, yeah. but I'm trying to keep mentally to yeah. that and try to keep efficient because, yeah, what we end up doing is you just making the project longer, yeah. and I could be a jerk and go, okay, we'll just keep building it. I mean, you're the one dragging it out and making it longer. We could have done this faster or cheaper for you, but... Time or materials. But I don't like taking that approach. Uh, that's also a good point. Depending on your billing, that, that might be a better perspective, the milestone. If, if for instance, it's an RFP, uh, it's a fixed bid, then milestones is pretty important to be able to express, uh, for instance, you know, the, the three-legged stool of marketing or of development. There's, we can do it pretty uh, and really high quality. We can do it cheap or we can do it fast. You can choose two, but you can't have all three. If your client has identified that timeline is the most important thing to them, setting milestones is absolutely uh, in the cards for agile, waterfall, any kind of project management. You have to do that to be able to report back. But in other situations, if timeline wasn't their biggest concern, if it was money, if it was quality, then maybe those milestones would be a little more loose. Uh, but still, I, I try to stick to, to my milestones pretty hard because once again, you want the trust of the stakeholders. And if you're not delivering to them in a demo that something that you said you would, uh, then that trust starts to wane. The other cool thing is if you can get the client to buy in and you are are you 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 are managing to uh, to deliver working software at the end of each sprint that you can demonstrate to them that you can show them yeah, show them how things are working um, that that's a, that's a huge win and uh, you know when I'm when I've worked in in uh, in um, agency land what we would do is uh, is build prototypes and use those prototypes to to get quick feedback and then uh, iterate on those prototypes that actually becomes the final product. Uh, eventually, but um, and that can often get their minds to just go click. Oh, I see. I get it. Awesome. We've done that. We're at time, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. If you have any questions, I'm on, on Twitter at the Justin Rhodes. Uh, you can find me at all social medias at that tag. Also, thank you so much for coming. That was great. Did you like it? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, I did. A lot. I appreciate that. A lot. I really appreciate that feedback. Oh, this is my tender story. I gave you the feedback. That was the best one. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, mean, I can read bullet points and I can download stuff on yeah. making it interactive, making it work. Awesome. Very good. Thank you so much. What's your name again? Dave, I'm Dave Blake. I work for Lucian in higher education, okay. so you're on the nose about. Awesome. Yeah. Clients, some are more reasonable than others. Some want it to be fast and perfect, and the, there is no compromise, and that's my daily struggle. And then you have to do a lot of social engineering to convince them that you so honestly, trust me on this. You know, you know? Project managers are not just project managers. We're sociologists. We're psychologists. <laughs> uh, some of the most important things that I've done were, were investing time in understanding how to talk to people a little bit better in a scientific way. So.
David Cialdini is one of my favorite authors. Uh, the Art of Persuasion is this kind of thing. Right, yeah. 50 Scientifically Proven Ways to Get a Yes. These are really instrumental ways in how I handle people. And getting clients to be a, internal stakeholders is really important to me. So. Yeah, I, um, I, the, the secondary thing is I don't have a dedicated project manager. Mm. So yep. I manage.